Um, so the session will be recorded. So I have hopefully just hit the record button. Um, it tells me it has. There were some issues with the last session uh, and it wasn't recorded. So Gil and Paul actually redid that one, which was uh, very nice of them so that we could have a copy up on the website. Hopefully I won't be doing that. Uh, we'll see how we go. Uh, and um, I'm not sure if we've really pointed it out, but uh, the, the sessions will be available on our website and it usually takes us a few days to have the copy and then upload it and um, have it available there. But uh, it's, it's usually available by the end of the week, but we say a Monday next week if you do want to catch the recording. Uh, and of course, if you'd like any copies from today, uh, you're more than welcome to, to ask and we're happy to, to send it through. Uh, disclaimer we have to put in there is just says that this is, is this general content. So it's not specific advice. It's not in writing. That's the first thing. All of our advice to you is in writing. And the second thing is that uh, it's not specific advice because it's not tailored to your circumstances. Okay, so market update. And the first thing I wanted to do was um, was just recap on uh, the, the COVID cases because that leads us into the Victorian lockdown and the impact on the economy and therefore markets. Um, and I guess uh, I, I think I saw we do have uh, one person who has dialed in who is in Victoria um, and uh, I hope uh, everyone's, everyone's okay and, and uh, keeping healthy and, and mentally healthy as well. Um, but I think you can see here by this graph that uh, our first wave, if, if we call it that, um, which led to our lockdown, our, our, you know, the entire country being locked down, uh, was, um, uh, was fairly minor compared to what's happening right now. And uh, the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because with, the, uh, with the, this sort of first wave, our actions um, were to our actions were to close down the economies and that had a real impact on, on the markets. And with, um, with the, the second wave, it has been mostly confined to Victoria, um, which I think is, you know, lucky for the rest of us. Uh, but um, that'll, that will have absolutely an impact on the Victorian economy. Um, so if we if we look at those cases, you can see that that's exactly how how it is. We've got Victoria that um, have uh, have had to lock down, um, and I guess we we haven't been entirely sure whether that lockdown would be, um, you know, how quickly it would go to stage four, how long it will stay in stage four, but um, but that impact on the economy is very real, and so what we've what we've seen over the last the last couple of months, and, and we look back at that announcement was made that stage four would be from the 8th of July, um, that it hasn't really affected the markets. And we, we absolutely thought there was a danger that that would, that, that would have a real impact. And if we think about the, the impact when the entire economy was shut down, which is what we saw in sort of that March period, and we look here, we're sort of, saying, okay, well, there's so far so good. Um, and it, it's not to say that it was all smooth sailing over that time. You can see the blue line here, uh, and apologies for these bars, that's uh, something I couldn't remove, it's the, the trading volumes. But uh, we're looking at the Australian share market, so the ASX 200, the top 200 stocks. And you can see over that time that uh, apart from sort of the end here, it was generally pretty positive. Um, However, it's likely to cost the, the economy as a whole, the Australian economy, between 10 to $12 billion. And that's not good news for those two guys that have, that have got the photos of there because they've got, an, they've got a, a budget coming up in October. And what they want to do is give out tax cuts because it's all well and good to, you know, to increase the amount of money that's going into uh, what was called New Start Allowance and is now called Job, job Seeker Allowance. Um, but um, politically, tax cuts, uh, tax cuts is, is, is more popular. Um, and if that's 10 to 12 billion out of the economy, that's a good slug of that that they can't give away. Uh, so we've got the budget coming up next month. Usually we would have them in April um, or May. Well, usually it's, the, usually it's the first week in May. We've had them in April in the past. Uh, and that's going to give us a pretty good representation of uh, what's, what, what's happening right now and what the government thinks we need to do going forward. 
but they're not happy about it. Uh, ScoMo and Frydenberg are not happy because they would prefer that they could give some, some of that money out as tax cuts because you increase the chances of being re-elected. Very cynical of me, I know, uh, but um, uh, I would still say that there are uh, quite a few uh, other countries around the world where um, I'd be a lot more cynical. So uh, at this stage, the Victorian lockdown hasn't had a major direct impact. However, that's not to say that it may not in the future. Uh, in terms of our report card, the next thing that we were worried was potentially going to be an issue was that we were going to have a recession. Now, it was very well projected that this would happen, but of course, the issue is that in order for there to be a recession, there needs to be two quarters of negative growth, two quarters being six months. So that's the point at which we know how bad it was, you know, five to six months ago. Now, the share market prices in that news immediately. So the share market went down. And uh, straight away, the worst was, you know, the, the worst was thought and, and it was priced straight into the market. But it does actually take time for the news to come out. So one of the concerns that we had or, or, you know, something that we had to be aware of was that when that news comes out, if the market is not going to behave rationally, then there's every chance that the market could fall quite dramatically on that news. Um, this is the same graph over the same six month period. And this is, it was basically a week ago that we, it was announced that we had had a recession. Uh, and we knew that it was going to be bad and it was bad. Uh, you know, we lived through it. You could, we weren't going out anywhere. Places were closed down. If you went, if you did go to, you know, a Westfield or a Charlestown Square or a Green Hills or any of these big shopping centres, hardly anything was open. So it didn't take a genius to figure out that, you know, there was going to be a problem coming up. Um, and so we, we got that news and the markets didn't immediately react poorly. So there was actually, you know, a few days where the market was up, it's come back down and sort of bounced back up again. Um, so in that case, we're, you know, we're sort of pleased that the market has actually behaved rationally here. Uh, and, and we haven't had any sort of silly, you know, selling and, and reductions. The next thing on our report card was that if we go back uh, you know, four or five months ago, we were concerned about the risk of dividends reducing and therefore the value of companies, you know, the share prices reducing, which then ultimately has that impact on your portfolios. And we were, we sort of had, you know, groups of companies where we thought some of these companies are actually going to do okay. Some of them, well, they're going to be, you know, it's not going to be easy for them, but they're not going to be as impacted as another group which some will go out of business and others will uh, will you know stop dividends altogether so if we go back a few months we were thinking that there were some companies or some sectors on the market that would have very low risk of their dividends being affected and you know you, you sort of think well that makes sense if we've got supermarkets people still need to buy food um, in fact, you know, people were buying a lot of a lot of things from the supermarket, a lot more than they needed. So there was, you know, prices of uh, prices were staying still. There was no specials available because if it was on the shelves, it was being bought. Um, telcos, so people are online more. So uh, you know, they've got the ability. Again, they don't have to discount. They've got the ability to uh, some of the bigger players to keep their prices high and say that they've got better quality coverage. Uh, pharmaceuticals, of course, because, you know, there's there's companies there that are trying to find cures, the vaccines. Um, so there's a group there. And, of course, iron ore, which is really um, has has pushed our economy. Without it, we'd, we'd be in a much deeper hole. Uh, those that's, that's sort of a group that we considered to be low risk of reducing their dividends. We then had sort of moderate risk. Um, and um, there we're talking about some of the financial companies. We're talking about... Uh, discretionary healthcare, so uh, you know a lot of elective surgery was put off, um, and um, and so there was a chance there that their earnings would be affected. And then we had high risk, so companies that shut down completely, some have gone out of business, um, and some have had additional restrictions placed on them, um, and and that actually includes the banks. So we had these companies grouped, and um, what we, we're hoping is that when earnings season comes, which is basically the month of August, we're hoping that their, their results are in line with those expectations, or maybe slightly better. 
If they're a lot worse, then the share price tends to fall and that obviously impacts and comes through to your portfolio. So what was our actual result? We separated into the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, the ugly basically means that those companies are not paying you know, any dividends at all. And if you have a look at the, the categories above and the, and the actual companies below, you'll see that that's pretty much in line. Uh, the only the only sort of thing to note there is that um, uh, the the areas that really struggled and and the banks are a big part of that. Um, the banks were actually had a restriction placed on them by APRA, and APRA said, "Well, please don't pay out dividends. We need to make sure this banking system is secured." And they put a limit on the amount you could pay out. Commonwealth Bank paid out up to that limit within 0.01%. So they basically said, we wanna, we, we've got enough money, we wanna pay the dividends. Some of the other banks did not. And they said, look, well, we're gonna hold back and we're gonna keep this money because we don't wanna risk there being um, any, you know, any concerns with our solvency. Um, but overall, if we look at that, we sort of say, yeah, look, that, that's, um, that's actually in line with what we had sort of hoped. Um, and so as that same graph again, um, if we look uh, the, um, the over the month, so I've just got the, the you know, this area here with the orange showing the last month, uh, it's, it was actually fairly positive. So we did get a few companies that surprised on the upside. Uh, and um, up until later in the month, um, yeah, that was something that, again, the market behaved rationally and we didn't have to worry about. Um, so I guess if we, we, go back, uh, we go back a few months and we think about that report card, what were the things we needed to be you know, potentially concerned about? Um, we, were, we got through all right. We've done pretty well there. Now, um, one thing that I did want to point out, and I think that uh, Gil and Paul might have discussed it last time, is that there has been a pretty big divergence in terms of what's happened in countries around the world and also within countries in certain sectors. So I hope you can see this okay. The, it looks like the, the, the graph, the lines haven't come out uh, perfectly well, but here we've got three, three lines. We've got three charts or three graphs, uh, three lines on the one chart. Um, and that is the NASDAQ. And that, that's basically your technology stocks in America. We've got the S&P 500 and that is the top 500 companies in America, which includes some of those companies on the NASDAQ. Uh, and we've got the ASX 200. And this is since the 20th of February. So the 20th of February was when um, everything went down. And that was when the, the market uh, had basically a, a four or five week period where um, on some share markets, it dropped to about minus 30 to minus 40%, and that was over about six weeks. So that was really rough. And uh, unfortunately, it's a bit difficult to see here, but um, you can sort of see that that was the, that was the trend over that, um, over that month. From there, however, it's been a very different story in terms of the recovery. So the Australian market um, is still down 14% from that point. And, and now we're not talking about 12 month periods here. We're picking the absolute top of the market. And we're seeing, well, how are we going getting back to there? So if we looked at our 12 months, because the first six months of this last 12 month period was very strong, when you don't have minus 14% returns. But if you looked at just the peak of the market, the Australian share market is down by 14%. The American share market has reached its high. And in fact, uh, it, it's actually come away from its high, but it's still, it's still above um, that, that level it reached on the 20th of September. The NASDAQ has pushed along really strongly. Now, a couple of reasons, and we've probably talked about it before, S certainly the US, but a lot of the countries overseas have had more of a focus on health, uh, sorry, on wealth rather than health. So what that's meant is that they've been reluctant to shut their economies down. So they have been basically just saying, look, keep going as normal and the health system will cope if it can. Now in the US, uh, again, you'll hear the cynical side of me come out, but uh, there's an election to win in November. And so uh, Donald Trump has been very much uh, for the term of his presidency so far, 
riding on the coattails of, um, of share market returns. So he wants the market to be high. He wants to be able to promote that he's been the president that's allowed that to happen, which means that he's not at all interested in, um, in shutting economies down for that, for, you know, to improve the health situation. And as a result, the economies have, you know, and then the companies in those economies have performed stronger. Um, so that's the first thing. But over here, we, you know, we, we looked at those case numbers. They were very, very low, but we shut the entire country down so that we could keep it low. And in Victoria, those case numbers are dropping back down again to a level that, you know, some areas in the US would be incredibly jealous of, but still, we're still in, you know, stage four lockdown. And, and that's just because we've got that focus on making sure that this doesn't get out of control um, as opposed to economic growth and, um, and making money. Now, I know that there's, you know, some contention over that about whether, you know, it's gone too far. Um, sitting here in New South Wales, I'm really pleased that they've done that. Now, obviously, it's easy for me to say, it's easy for us who are in New South Wales to say that because, it hasn't affected us, but it's it's almost like Victoria's taken one for the team here. Uh, now, the government it's 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 nice to say that the government's had a focus on um, on the health outcome, but because our health system is public publicly funded, they would have to foot the bill anyway. So I think that um, you know again that cynical side says, well, you know either way they've got to pay. Um, this way they've you know they've they've taken that sort of you know human element a little bit more. Um, now, so that's the difference between Australia and, and the US. But then the companies that have performed really strongly have been those technology companies. And the Australian share market doesn't have a large technology sector. I, I think we've probably got about, you know, 10 stocks maybe. But on, in the US, I mean, you think about those big names. They, they call them the FANG stocks. Um, you know, Facebook, uh, Amazon, uh, Google, Netflix, you know, these companies that, that are household names. And they've done really, really well over the, over the last six months. Uh, in fact, they've done so well. And um, uh, we're obviously using Zoom right now. Uh, last week, uh, overnight, Zoom had a 40% increase in one night in terms of its share price. And when you see that, you start to think, hang on a minute, I'm not sure whether that's rational. And because remember that the share market being irrational can work both ways. It can go down further than it should and go up further than it should. So when we see those sorts of things, we think, well, is there the potential that we have another tech bubble on our hands? And that takes us back to 1999. So what, what we have access to a lot of information from a lot of different people, from uh, you know, analysts and fund managers and commentators and economists and the people who are running the super funds and the investment portfolios and the, and the pension platforms that you hold, we, we like to recommend that you have a mix of investments and we like to recommend that they have different philosophies with how they manage money. Some of those fund managers are absolutely absolute bulls, and they think that this is the start of um, a very, very strong period, and it's absolutely fine that the share prices are going up like that in that in that tech area. Others um, have a complete opposite view, and they say, "Well, no, we want to see these companies making money. We want to see their earnings justify their share price." And some of them are saying. Well, we don't, um, we're, we're not, not sold on this. Um, now, the, the point then is, well, what's, what's likely to happen? And what if we get one of those extremes, either positive or negative? So this, um, this graph, which hopefully is not too small as, and, and you can read it, has got a couple of, couple of lines on it. And it shows the, a three year period um, from the blue line being when uh, the American market had its recovery after the GFC. It shows the red line, which is the American market right now, and um, it's from the low, so, you know, basically six months, 180 days. It shows an orange line, which is what happened to Japan in 1990. So we'll all remember Japan throughout the 1980s was the absolute way every country 
should operate and what everyone aspired to. And then throughout the 1990s, they really struggled with, they, they had a, 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 property, a property bust. Um, there was no growth and no inflation in the economy and it, no, uh, the interest rates were at basically zero um, and it sort of went nowhere. Um, and then we also have the yellow line, which is the one at the bottom. I'm not sure how well the, the, uh, the yellow and the orange comes out, but the yellow is when we had the tech bubble, the, the tech bust, um, which happened in the year 2000. So what this tells us is that if we have one of those periods where it is a tech bust, um, it could be three years before those particular stocks make any money. Um, if we have a period like Japan had where our interest rates are very, very low and there's no economic growth, then we could have a period where there's three years where the economy doesn't go anywhere and those companies aren't making any money. If we have a recovery like we had from 2009, then the three year period could be phenomenal and the, and the value of those investments could double. Now, the reality is it'll be somewhere in between. Um, I think that, uh, that we, at the moment, in terms of this current path, which is this here, I think that uh, in terms of, and this is, remember this is the US we're talking about, not Australia. Australia hasn't you know, pushed into this, this, this potential bubble, if that's what it is. Um, but I think that um, uh, it's very optimistic to assume that that will keep going. But it's also very, very pessimistic to assume that it's simply gonna drop back down to here. Uh, so the, how, do we, how do we make that call? Um, we've got to basically look, and, and uh, Gil can't be in the presentation, but I certainly had to make sure he, he appeared somehow. Um, we have to look at those competing forces and we've got to try and figure out, well, do we have a glass half full or is it a glass half empty? So our bear case, our glass half empty case is that there is too much government debt. The government is going to huge amounts of debt to try and keep the economy going. There's a wave of bankruptcies. Some, some businesses are gone. Some industries have been devastated and won't be the same. There's unemployment that um, is going to take some time to, um, to adjust. Uh, we've got the potential for deflation. So we're throwing money, quantitative easing, QE, is when you throw a lot of money into the economy, but there's no inflation as a result. Um, and in fact, there can be deflation. And that's the experience Japan had throughout the 1990s. Uh, because we've got this virus, we've got people who are not prepared to take risks. Um, and so that means that people stay on the sidelines rather than investing. And there's also an argument to say that those equities are overvalued. The interesting thing about that argument is that it's not all equities. There's just a pockets of certain companies that are overvalued. And there are other areas on the market that are not overvalued at all. That's our bear case. And, and there's, if you want to, you can take those points and create them as your argument. We've then got the bull, the bull case or our ha glass is half full case. And that is that we're at the start of a recovery. Will we, will we, of course we are. We've just had you know, the worst recession in living memory um, and we're recovering out of it. That's absolutely what's happening. Uh, Victoria, fingers crossed and you know, touch wood, um, we hope that it's not too much longer before those lockdowns are eased and people can get back to you know, going to work and, and doing the things that they would normally do. We've also got governments who are prepared, and this is unlike what we've had in the past, we've got governments who are prepared to do whatever it takes to keep the economy going. To go into, to go into debt if they have to, to give money to people to spend uh, and to stimulate the economy. We also have, for the first time, um, monetary policy, which is your use, the Reserve Bank's use of interest rates and affecting the supply of money, and fiscal policy, which is the government spending money, working together. So for the last, ooh, I would say since probably Kevin 07, um, and maybe even a little bit of John Howard, the governments didn't want to spend money. So the way you got re-elected, and John Howard proved this, well, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know if he proved it, but certainly it was the lesson people took out from his, um, you know, his, his time as prime minister. If you could balance a budget and not spend too much money, keep interest rates coming down, the economy would grow, 
we wouldn't have too much inflation and people would be generally better off. So what that meant was that um, whoever was in power, and it doesn't matter if it's Labor, Labor or Liberal, they were reluctant to spend money to stimulate the economy and they left all the heavy lifting to, uh, to the Reserve Bank through monetary policy to reduce rates. Now, they could do that because rates were fairly high. As they've come down, the government's realised, well, this, you know, we actually have to help out here. And so that's, that's happening now for the first time in a long time. They've got sort of both barrels that they're using. Um, we've got capacity. So there are people there who are ready to come in um, and join the workforce. If we can get a vaccine, we'll reopen. And, um, and you know, and even, you know, we're sort of looking uh, not even that far. It, it'd be great for Victoria if those numbers can come down and they can sort of, you know, replicate what we have right here. Um, but in terms of... Um, in terms of the vaccine, there are a lot of people and, and especially our clients who might have wanted to take a holiday um, and might have spent, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, but haven't been able to. And, you know, if you can, you still want to do it. If that vaccine's there, you, you know, you'll have the confidence to do it. Um, we've also got that, and I guess that relates to the pent up demand, is that uh, people have started to save. So um, I don't know if you saw, but earlier this week, there was some uh, articles from, uh, that were written about some of the banks. And for the first time in a long time, people have been paying down their credit card debts and their personal loans. Now, that's a very good thing. Um, but it also means that those people are probably getting ready to run them back up again and buy the things that they haven't been able to buy. Uh, there are, uh, I've, I've noticed that... Um, uh, if you drive past car yards at the moment, a lot of them don't have a lot of stock because if you go back six months, people weren't out buying new cars and trading in their old ones. Um, so now when they've gone in to pick up their cars, they're only just, you know, if they're buying new cars from, you know, from sort of now a few, a few months ago, it's, uh, they're only just starting now to rebuild that stock. Uh, and we've got low interest rates. And, and I think... Um, I probably it's something I tend to whine on about, but um, when interest rates are low, that tends to be good for shares because if you've got a choice of 1% in a term deposit, or you can invest in a company that's paying you 4% as a dividend, and it might have franking credits attached. Now, a couple of years ago, there was some concern about whether they'd be taken away. They haven't been, we've still got them. If you've got those franking credits attached, that might make it through that tax benefit you know, four and a half to, sorry, five and a half to 6%. There's people that will take that risk. And let's look, I'll, I'll invest in those shares because I can get five times the return I can in a term deposit. So even if the share price goes down three or 4%, I'm still in front. So when interest rates are low, that tends to be supportive for equities. Now, I'm not sure if I gave you any indication of, of where I feel we sit, um, but um, I can absolutely see more of a positive case than a negative. Now, um, I'm, so I, I would be thinking that the glass is definitely half full and has the potential to, you know, to, to, to get fuller. Um, I'm not sure if that's a statement or if that's a saying, but uh, I've just made it once. So, um, so I, I think that things are pretty positive for me. Having said that, there are absolutely some areas that are probably too high, you know, in terms of their share price. There's some companies, some, some sectors, um, and, and investing in those sectors would be quite risky because of the levels that they're at right now. So what's the impact on the portfolios? Well, all of this is fine, but what it comes back to is that if, and, and you know, we've probably been a bit of a broken record player about this, but if you've got a portfolio that needs an income, we want you to have up to five years of that income in safe assets. And the reason that we do that is because the worst periods that we've had on the share market, it could have taken five years for it to bounce back. Now, the US market is already back uh, in six months. It was already back. So really, there's not a lot that we have to worry about there. The Australian market has still got some way to go. What we know is that we don't want you to sell when it's low and we want you to be able to participate in the recovery. So to do that, we need to make sure that the income you need to draw from that portfolio is not coming from those assets that have gone down in value. So that's the number one thing. The second thing is that 
when we recommend a portfolio that has exposure to those growth assets like shares and property, we usually put a mix of managers in there. And I don't know if you've ever sort of thought, you've looked at you know, some of the reports we send you or you've been in for a meeting and we've sort of talked through these eight or 10 or 12 different funds and you sort of think, geez, why have I got all of these investments? I don't know. Um, the reason is that we split the portfolio into asset classes. So let's say shares being one asset class. We then further split that into Australian and international shares. So we're you know, talking different managers each time. And then, and then we look and we split that into different approaches to the way that they want to manage the money. And that means that sometimes one approach will be in favour and others will be, other times it'll be the other approach that's in favour. We would love to have a crystal ball that tells you exactly where, um, you know, where to, where to put your money. Um, and if, uh, if any of you have um, been on a Zoom call with me before, you've probably heard me use the joke, if we, if we did know exactly where that, you know, where, where you would make all your money, then this background would not be a fake green screen background. It would be the island that I own. And I'd be sitting there at the moment facing the other direction with a drink in my hand. But unfortunately, uh, no one has that information. So all we can do is make sure that we structure the portfolio well, so that when those irrational times come and the market is too low, we can ride it out. And if the market is too high, we can look to take profits and boost up those other areas of the portfolio. Uh, but the portfolio, your portfolio, understanding all of this, uh, you know, everything that's going on in the economies in the share markets, it's all about diversification and understanding what you need from the portfolio. So it's fine while you're still building wealth and accumulating wealth that um, so it's not fine. Uh, but if the money, if you if the value of your investments goes down, you're still investing through super, you're still putting money in. So you're buying in while it's lower. When you hit retirement, the opposite happens and you're actually taking money out. So the only thing we want to make sure is that you don't take it out of areas that have fallen in value. Okay, um, that's pretty much everything I wanted to run through. I didn't manage to keep to 20 to 30 minutes, but uh, I'm not too far off. Um, I don't think that we have any questions. I'll just bring up, Just I do, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, question from Sheree. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, just um, oh, yeah, and from, uh, and from Ross in Victoria, yes, in lockdown, so at home. Uh, yeah, I hope everything's going okay, Ross. It's, um, uh, ho yeah, hopefully there's some light at the end of the tunnel there. Um, and I guess it's, you know, it's a good thing that you're still able to, still able to be working from home. Um, and question from Sheree, um, which, uh, yeah, is, I guess, just some personal experience uh, in terms of, um, of the economy and, uh, and, and tradies. Um, it, I wish I had uh, a great answer there. I think um, given what's happened in the economy, we would have assumed that uh, people were keen to, you know, keen to, keen to get work. Um, but uh, exactly how that goes, it's, it's, it's anyone's guess whether, uh, you know, whether you can get someone who's A, going to do, do a good job for you, but B, give you a reasonable, reasonable quote. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, it's, it's, yeah, one thing to talk about it based on the economy, another one um, on, on real life and, and anecdotal evidence. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's all of the... I think that's all of the questions. Um, I don't seem to have any flashing orange lights in front of me. Um, so, as I mentioned before, we will put um, we'll put the the recording up uh, by the start of next week. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you do have any other questions, please let us know. If you'd like copies of the slides, let us know. Um, if you've got any particular topics you'd like us to cover, uh, please feel free to send us an email. Uh, anyone at the office, you can drop us drop us a line. Uh, but um, otherwise, uh, thanks very much for your time uh, and I uh, look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you. Thanks.